Good evening, everyone. It's the last edition or the last session for this edition on design goes to schools designology. Um, thank you so much for joining, sir. You're welcome. Uh, okay. We have more people joining. Thank you, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Blessing, Bossman. Thank you. So we are waiting for more people to come on board before we start um, today's edition. Okay. Yesterday was a wonderful um, session with Mary of McPhee. Um, though the network was acting up really, really bad, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure we were able to get a lot of things from yesterday's session. And today is just going to be another wonderful. Um, me, myself, I've been waiting for this edition, like this session. Um, with Mr. Tola Labi is one great, one of the um, the big bosses in the industry that I look forward to um, having this great discussion with today. So our guest is here already, but why we okay? Today is just going to be a continuation of yesterday's topic. The influence of design on choice and decision making, the part two. Thank you, thanks for joining Jagade. Thank you so much. Okay, Mr. Tola Labi. I'm sure you're ready for us and we'll be bringing you up like shortly. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. So a quick rundown of um, how the session has been since Monday. Today happened to be the final um, session we'll be having for this first edition because the Xenology will be, we plan it to be like um, a continuous program that we'll be having to share knowledge about design and how it relates to human life, human daily, li daily life. So um, this is the first edition and the second edition will be announced just a glued to our our page it will be announced as soon as we are ready for that so we've talked about so far we've talked about um design thinking we've talked about human centered design yesterday we talked about the influence of design on choice and decision making the part one and today we'll be talking about influence of design on choice and decision making the part two with mr tola labi Mr. Tola Labi is the um, creative director at Tola Labi Design. Uh, he's okay. I, I think I don't need to, to to talk much about him. I'll bring him in now, so he can introduce himself properly because much as 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 um, the person himself. So thank you so much for joining. And we pray that the network work for our favor today. Thank you so much. So good to see you, sir. <laughs> you too. Thank you. Thank you for, for honoring our invite. Sir. We are so glad to have you. Thank you. Thank and how you. Thank has it been for inviting me? Uh, it's but a it has pleasure, been good. Sir. It has been great. <laughs> it has been really good. All right. 
All right, so I'm sure yeah. you're you really, really emotionally prepared for us. Yeah, I can hear you. Just let us know oh. if you can hear both of us well in the comment session. Um, oh. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for being here. Hi, personally, I'm so grateful. All right, so today we'll be talking about the influence of design on choice and decision making, the part two. And yesterday we had um, an amazing lady who has been in the design industry for like, she has been doing great for herself. And um, we, we were able to talk about few things. Though the network was not very favorable, that yesterday, but I'm, I'm sure it's going to everything will work in our favor this time around, and we'll be able to talk extensively on this topic and for people to also grab what we have on ground. So, quickly, sir, I would like you to introduce yourself while you go into the main topic for today. Okay, all right. Okay, I, I, I have some things written out here, the order in which things I would like things to go. Mm -hmm. okay, so the sir. first thing I want us to do is let us pray, if you don't mind. All right, sir. No problem, sir. All right. Um, God, please let this session go well. Let the internet work well. And let it Amen. not disgrace itself. And Amen. we pray that even if, if it doesn't go well in any way, the internet connection, give people patience to stick it through to the end of the session. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. So it's very important because very um, the, the internet situation is very, <laughs> is, is, is very uncontrollable. So, yes, um, but, but um, my name is Tola Alabi. Um, I, a lot of people know me as a graphic designer. Um, so yeah, I am a graphic designer. To my very elemental state, state I'm a designer. I'm a graphic designer. Um, but beyond that, if I want to go deeper, I am a thinker. I do a lot of thinking about how people act, um, why people act in certain ways. So I'm a thinker. I question a lot of things. I like to communicate with people. I like to communicate with myself. Um, I'm a teacher, and um, I try to break down things to people in a way that they can understand, and to bring it to to kind of bring it down to a level that. Um, a four-year-old can understand. So I like communicating in simple terms. And I am a, I'm a son. I am a brother. I'm a husband. I'm a father. Those are the most important things to me, apart from being a designer. Before being a, a designer, I'm, I'm all those things. So those are the most important things to me. So that's me in a nutshell. We celebrate you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank sir. you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so going straight into today's topic now, um, we're talking about the influence of design on choice and decision making. What do you have for us? Okay, um, I've been I've been following the the sessions um, over the past few days, and um, you. you've had a lot of amazing speakers. A lot of people have come on and they've spoken about their topics very well. And when, me going last right now just gives me the opportunity to copy and paste a lot of things that people have said before and just <laughs> make my own out of it. So I'm, I'm happy I'm going last. So um, I have a lot of resources to work with. Um, now, I realize that everybody, every, everyone that you've called to speak or everyone that has spoken before me has started off by defining design. And that's always a good place to start. So b yes, before sir. we can know the influence of design on people and decision making, we must be able to define what design is. So that's the first thing I have on my list here. What is design? Now let, let me try to break it down um, in as simple words as possible. Design to me, it's a plan, it's a plan towards implementing something. It's a plan towards doing something. That's what design is to me. So if, if um, I plan to walk to my, my living room right now, um, I just say, okay, I'm going to use this path to get to the living room. That's, that's design. I've designed it in my head, what I want to do. Um, if, if I want to go out to the filling station, I, I kind of design it in my head first. I say, okay, what plan? Okay, where am I going to use? What, what route am I going to use to get there? That's design. It's as basic as that, you understand? Um, so design is a plan you make towards something. Now, um, this, this, this topic, the, the moment you gave me this topic, you know, 
I thought about it. I know I told you today that I, um, I like to, I like to have question and answer sessions because yes, I'm not really a monologue type kind of person. But I like to have you know people's so um, people's feedback. Um, so yes, so you know when you came up with this topic, how does design help in decision making? And I said that's a very simple thing to talk about. Um, how design helps in decision making. We can talk about this thing in ten minutes and we're gone. The the question is. Does design help you to choose between two things? Yes. That's the, that's, that's the simple answer. Everybody knows design helps you. How does design help you to choose between two things? Item A and item B. How does design help you? Design helps you in the fact that design makes things better. That's what design does. Good design makes things better. That's the aim of good design. It makes things better. It gives a better experience. So I, 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 and you, there, are, there, are, there are four major types of experiences, or five. And um, there is the visual experience, which is what we see. Okay. And a lot of times when we talk about design, we, we kind of limit, limit it to that visual experience. How does it look? So design makes it look better, you understand? So you can judge based on, oh, this looks better. I'll go for this. Because we, we all want something better. Nobody ever wants something Definitely. that is not as good. So if it looks better... We, we have a tendency to go for it. Um, the second experience is called the tactile experience. Tactile. And that means how does it feel? How does it feel? Um, does it feel good? Does it feel good on me? You understand? Does it make me feel good? You understand? And there are a lot of people that are into giving you a better tactile experience. Um, like fashion designers now. The, but, but, you know, sometimes you can wear a shirt and just say, man, I just like the way this shirt feels. It just feels so, so good against my skin. You understand what I'm saying? Sure. Or people that, that are into um, cosmetology, cosmetologists, they are into how it feels too. They're like, how does, how does this cream feel on your body? Do you understand? Does it absorb well or does it, or, or, or does it feel greasy? Do you understand? So that's another experience. There's the experience of, there's the audit, auditory experience. And that's how does it sound? And, and, and designers also think of how things sound. Um, so you can think of a music producer as a designer. You understand? Um, yeah. The, the, the sound, sound, like, sound design. The sound is a music producer. So he, he designs sound. Um, Timberland is a music producer. He designs sound. Don Jazzy is a music producer. You know? So these are designers too. Because you judge this on how does it sound. Even singers are designers too. So you kind of say, oh, what, what song sounds better? Oh, this guy's song sounds better. The beat sounds better. So I'll listen to this over this. So that's designer experience. Then there's the olfactory experience, which is how does it smell? How does it taste? You understand? And, and a good example of people that go into this kind of design is um, chefs, cooks, people that cook. You can judge what food you are going for by how it smells. What does it smell like? You understand? And, and that can even trigger off a sense of, oh man, I feel like eating now based on what I'm smelling. Sometimes you might go out and you smell jello fries and you go home and you say, man, I'm going jello fries tonight. Or you go out and you smell indomie. I feel, I feel like eating indomie. So someone has designed how it smells to make you do something and how it tastes too. You understand? So, so th those are different ways in which design influences. They influence us because they make a better experience for how it looks, how it feels, how it sounds, how it smells, and how it tastes. And so if, if you realize this, you realize that not only the graphic designer is a designer, the music producer is a designer, the chef is a designer, the cosmetologist is a designer. You understand? So there are a lot of people that design. So, so, so design helps you to make informed decisions based on making a product or a service better, enhancing it. And... Um, that, that kind of leads us to how, how, what, how to make a design that influences a decision. How do, you, how do you, as a designer, make a design that influences a decision? Now, because design is so wide, I will narrow it down to visual design because a yes. lot of people that, that, that are joining us now, a lot of us are graphic designers. So we concentrate a lot on the visual design. So I'll kind of narrow down what I'm talking about to visual design, not go outside of that for too long. Now, how yes, do you yeah. make design that influences people? 
you understand? What is the main ingredient that you need as a graphic designer to make a design that influences people to make better decisions? What's the one element that you need? Because I thought about it, we have over, I, I don't think I'll be wrong if I say we have over 1 million designers in Nigeria. I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think I'll be wrong if I give that information. No, you're not. You're not. Because I, I'm considering people that are actively into design and people that are passively into design. That means people that do design as they are 9 to 5 and people who do design like superheroes in the night whereby they are accountants in the day and they are graphic designers in the night. at night. So, so you have those two kinds of people that are passively. And I, I think we have up to a million people in Nigeria that do, do design like that. And um, the problem is, since we have so many designers in Nigeria, why is it that when it comes to design in itself, we can still look at Nigerian design and still say, ah, man, I'll still go for the American design. I'll still go for this one that looks foreign over the Nigerian design. Why isn't our design as good as foreign design? You understand? So, uh, and why doesn't our design help to influence a customer's decision? And it, it, it comes down to one major ingredient, and that is empathy. Everybody that has spoken Can you hear me? Yeah, I can speak on that. Yes, sir, I can hear you. Okay. I'll say that one ingredient that is very important in, in make, doing design that influences people, right, is empathy. Empathy. And I know we've all heard that word empathy before because nearly everybody that you, that you told to come and speak spoke about empathy. Now, what is yes, empathy? Sir. And what is the place of empathy in design? Now, empathy is, is a passion about what you are doing as a designer, wanting to solve a problem. You understand? Once you have empathy for a, pro for a project or a design project that you are doing, you are more likely to create something that influences people positively. Once you have that key ingredient, you have a passion to solve a problem, to, say, to see every design challenge as a problem that needs to be solved. You will realize that you would be working with empathy. And when you work with empathy, you would, you would create things that influences people well. You understand? So your, so your, sure. your design would have more of an, a positive effect on the people that use it. So empathy is very important. Being, being passionate about what you are doing and solving people's problem is very important. But there are two things. There are two things that, that work, that kill empathy and that makes design bad. Because once empathy goes out of design, design becomes bad. It begins to fail. Once you, once, once you become less empathetic about the people that are going to contact your design, your, your design begins to fail automatically. And there are two things that cause design to fail. Two, two, two key things. The first thing is ego. Ego. E-G-O. Um, and you can also call it pride. And it is something that even I have, have had to deal with in my career. And a lot of designers deal with this. Now, how does pride affect empathy? Now, pride affects empathy in design when, it, when a client comes to you and says, I want you to design a, a, a logo for me or a flyer for me. And then you start designing to impress yourself or to impress other designers just to show that you are a, you are a bad guy. You understand, you're a design bad guy. That, that's where ego comes in. And I used to do that when I, when I started designing. I would see I'm a font. Too. <laughs> <I> would, <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are guilty. I would see a font and I would download it and I would say, the next logo I'm doing, I'm using that font. I don't care who the person, what I'm designing for, that font, because that font is so cool, I have to use it. So I would, I would see a, a font that is like grunge a very grunge, rough-looking font. And because I just have to use that font for the next project, I use it for a nursery school, and I use a grunge. And the clients say that they, they don't like it. And I'm like, why don't you like it? That's a nice font. Now. That's a cool font. I tell the client it's a cool font because I think it's cool. You understand? That is my pride talking. Because I want to do things for myself. I want to impress myself. I want to prove to myself that I'm a good designer. So that's where ego can stop you from having empathy. Because you don't care about the project anymore. You care about how you feel 
and how you can prove to other designers that you are a good designer. You understand? So that's ego. It stops empathy. And we must realize that the best designs, the most functional design, the best designs are the ones that people look at and don't even realize that anything has been designed. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. The best designs are the ones that you look at and you can look through the design and get what the designer or, or what the, the, the owner of the brand is trying to tell you. That means if you are designing a, a flyer for a, for a body cream or for sunglasses, and the first thing when people see that flyer or that ad is to say, wow, I love this design. This design is so nice. It means that you are beginning to fail as a designer because, because your design now has gone be, before the product. A good design, on the other hand, when they look at it, the first thing they will say is, wow, I really should buy this body cream. I really should buy this, this sun, sunglasses. What they see first is the product, you understand? So they are inspired to buy the product. So they don't even think about the design. And that's why you can look through magazines and you even forget that someone designed that magazine. They're just looking through it and just enjoy the experience of looking through it. Because the design is so good, it seems so natural that nobody even thinks that somebody has designed it. But sometimes our design can be so strong because our ego is in it. It becomes so strong that people see our design first before they even see what the design is trying to say. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, and, sure. and you look at the way the world is designed. The world is designed by God. You understand? And the truth is, it's only at times when you are really reflective that you look at the sky and say, oh man, God really did a good job with the sky. You understand what I'm saying? Or yeah. God really did a good job with the fields, with the grass, with everything. When you're really reflective. But on a good day, just look at this thing and they just fit into everything because it's awesome design. And that's how awesome design is. Awesome design doesn't shout at you. It fits in so well that the product becomes the thing in the forefront. So the first thing that stops empathy is ego. When you are when you are trying to prove yourself and think of how many likes you get when you put it on Facebook or when you put it on Instagram or when you put it on whatever platform. When, when the likes come before the functionality, your ego is stopping you from doing design that influences. The second thing is very close to ego too and they're almost spelled the same way. The second thing that stops design from being influential or from influencing people to make good decisions is is what I term ego. Ego. Mm -hmm. You know what ego is? Yeah. Ego in, in ego is money. You understand? It's almost spelled the same way as ego. But ego is one thing that stops people from doing really awesome functional design. It stops you from being creative. It stops you from being empathetic. And I meet a lot of people, designers in that mood. And I have been like that too. Especially when you are broke as a designer. I think when you're broke, it's a really bad time to design. Because when you design for money, you give up some of your creative powers. And you now begin to go for a ride. You understand? Where the, where the client begins to take you for a ride. Now, um, when you're designing out of need, you're only thinking, let me finish this job so that the client can pay me their, my balance and I can move on to the next person. Once that is your mentality, you can never be empathetic in design. And I meet a lot of designers that tell me, oh, this project is going on for too long. I've been designing this thing for two months, for three months. I just want to end this. But the problem is, because you are thinking of the bottom line, and the bottom line is always, let me get paid. So when you are, you are thinking, at the end of this project, let me just get paid and move on, you won't be empathetic enough to be patient and do it right. And I tell people about um, the FedEx logo. And, and I once read that the FedEx logo took uh, about nine months to do. That FedEx logo, that you, all, you, you cannot see any website that talks about good logos and talks about... Oh, can you hear me? Yes, no, I can hear you, sir. Sorry, it was the next one. Okay. Okay, okay. Did you get the last thing I said? 
You're talking about the FedEx logo. I don't know. Yeah, did, did you hear the last thing I said? You're talking about the FedEx logo. Okay, great. I, I'll talk about the FedEx logo. It took nine months to create that logo that you see on every design blog now when they're talking about good logos. Nine months of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that's because they were not motivated by ego or ego, you understand? <laughs> they were not motivated by money. They were motivated by solving a problem. And that's why when, when they released that logo, it started to solve problems. The visual problem of how it looks became really, really good. You understand what I'm saying? So, so yes, sir. you need to be able to be patient. So I find designers in those two categories, those that are motivated by ego, that always feel like I need to prove myself. So they are designing for themselves. They are designing to prove that they are design bad guys. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You will never solve problems like that. And then people that are also designing because of money. Their motivation is, let this person pay me money so I can buy a recharge card. Let this person pay me money so I can, you know. So money now becomes, and, and when you are motivated by money, the, the issue now becomes the fact that the client begins to ride you. And, and the design is never fun when the client begins to ride you. Because the, the client now dictates everything. The client says, okay, I've paid you 50000 I want you to use color purple when it doesn't work. I want you to use this font when it doesn't work. But because money is the driving force, you still move and act because of money. So it's, it's, like, it's like the horse and carrot situation. Because the, the client is always dangling that carrot, which is your balance payment. They get you to do things you don't want to do and things you shouldn't do as a designer. So those things kill empathy. Because if you're empathetic enough about a client's project, you know what? Empathetic designers can walk away from projects. Can say, this thing is not going where I want it to go. It's, it's not going where it should be going as a brand. You understand? It's not, it's not making sense. It's not solving a problem of how does it look or, or how does it sound or how does it feel. And you can say, you know what? I'm out. I'm out because it's not working. I'm, I'm empathetic enough to bow out of this project. You understand? So you, you as a designer, you, you must get to that place where you're empathetic enough to say, despite the money I'm getting paid, I'm doing this thing to solve a problem. And if you continue going down this road, you're not going to solve any problem. So I'm out of it. You understand? So those are things that kill empathy in the project. It is, it is the fact that ego comes and also a need for money when people are designing. So those are, those are the things that, that work, works against doing really influential, influential design that helps people to make better decisions. Now, the, the, the crux of the matter is not about whether design helps you to make better, better decisions or not. Because we know design helps you to make better decisions. If you do good design, people will choose the better design over the, the the bad design. Nobody ever chooses bad design. Whether it is design of sound, design of smell, design of no, nobody, 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 nobody will ever choose being locked up in a toilet as opposed to being locked up in a room that is that smells nice. Nobody ever chooses that. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, so design does solve a problem. But what what I want us to really focus on in this um, in this session is what kind of problems are you solving? What kind of decisions are you making? Are you, are you leading people to, 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 you understand? That is the most important yes. thing. And I'm going to call that, how do you make money from influencing decisions as a designer? How do you make money? From, because that's where the money is. People don't pay you just to use Photoshop or to use CorelDRAW. People pay you to use Corel Draw or Photoshop or Illustrator to get people to do something. You understand? So if you're creating that logo, doesn't get more people to buy a product, then you, you really haven't solved the problem. If you're creating that design, doesn't lead people, influence people to do something, then you, you, really, have not, you really have not done anything as a designer. You're just very skilled, but you're not a very functional designer. So... How, how do you make money from influencing decisions? And, and that, that, that brings me to what I call a design pyramid. Have you ever heard of a design pyramid before? Yes, I have. 
you have. Okay. Now, I'm not sure if the pyramid I'm going to tell you about right now is the same pyramid you have in your mind. But um, the, okay. the pyramid in design. And, and it, it tells you how much you can earn as a designer. You understand? So, and there are three levels in the, in the design pyramid. Um, so I'll start from the bottom and I'll work my way up. Now, all these people on this level, on this, in this pyramid of design, uh, they all solve a problem. They all solve a problem. All of them. And they all get paid. But some of them get paid more than the others. Because some solve a bigger problem than others. Now, everyone that is watching this session right now, I want you to take time to think of where you fall in this pyramid that I'm going to explain to you. Because every designer falls on that. There is no designer outside this pyramid. Everyone is within this pyramid. So as, I, as I'm going to describe the pyramid, just think of where you fall into and think of how much you are making on that level and think of how to get to the next level if you want to make more money from influencing people. Now, the bottom part of the pyramid, and um, this is a discussion I had with a good friend of mine, Inka um, Adesheson, and we were talking about this a while back, and I, we were talking about levels of design. And that's why we have 1 million designers in Nigeria and about 900,000 are complaining about how much they are making because a lot of them are in that bottom pyramid, in the bottom part of the pyramid, which is not bad. But I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you what is, why they are earning so little. Now, the bottom part of the pyramid is people we call artifact designers. They are called artifact designers. Now, what the problem they solve, the artifact designer, they solve a problem. And, and, we, and, the, and remember, all levels solve a problem. But the artifact designer yeah. solves a product problem. That's the problem of the artifact designer. That's the pro problem you solve. And that's, that's the influence you make on people. So you influence people to choose between products. That's what the artifact designer does. And what, what is an artifact? It is anything, a product. It might be a flyer. So people call you to design a product, an artifact. So they call you design a flyer or design a logo. So you're always designing, you understand? Design a flyer, design a logo, or design a website. That's an artifact. Design um, um, a UX, you understand? UI UX. Um, design, yeah. design something, you understand? So design a brochure. That is all artifact design. And a good 90% of designers in Nigeria fall under artifact designers. That, you know, so, so, so they are the regular graphic designers that we know. So a client calls you and tells you, design a wrapper for this biscuit that we are selling. So you design the wrapper and it looks nice. You put a good font, you put good photography, good typography, everything looks nice. That when they take the biscuit to the supermarket, when people look at it and they want to choose between the two, they choose your own because your own looks nice. So you have designed a better artifact because you're an artifact designer. You understand? The problem with being an artifact designer is that it doesn't solve a big problem. So you don't get paid much. You can never get paid much as an artifact designer. And I meet, I meet a lot of designers that tell me, why I, I want to increase my pay. I want people to pay me more. And my, my, my issue is just solve a bigger problem. You understand? Once you solve a bigger problem, they will pay you more. You understand? So it's not like the client is being unfair or that the client is being stingy or the client is being thrifty. No, it's just the fact that you are not solving a big, a big enough problem for the people. You see, you, you, cannot be a, you, can, you cannot be paid millions as a designer if you are designing the wrapper for sweets. It's not possible. You, you, sweets wrapper design cannot get you millions. You know, as a matter of fact, you cannot, get, you cannot be a very wealthy designer if all you are designing are logos. Logos do not solve big problems. That's just the reality. And that's why when people tell me um, we, want, we, should be, we should be giving as much respect as doctors, as pilots, I'm like, that, that, there's, no, there's no symmetry in that logic. There's no way. Because a doctor can save your life. Do you understand? There's no bigger problem than saving your life. A pilot can, can save your life. If a pilot doesn't do his work well, hundreds of people will die. So you, you cannot compare that to you doing a bad flyer 
you understand? A bad flyer, nobody loses the thing, you just be angry, you understand? But but nobody has a heart attack from being a bad flyer. You understand? It, it does it doesn't, it doesn't work. So 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 you need to solve a bigger problem. So you the, the problem with artifact design is that you only get paid as much as the artifact does. And the artifact can only do so much. So we have a lot of artifact designers in Nigeria. And um, I would use a, let me try to use a constant example through all the illustrations. So let me use a school. What is the artifact that schools need? School, a school can call you as a designer and say, Kunle, um, we want you to design our flyer. We, um, our, we are going to be resuming school in September. Um, I want you to design a good flyer. So they will give you all the photos you need. Put these photos together, design about five flyers for us. You understand what I'm saying? So you are designing yes, the sir. artifact, the flyer. Or they might call it to say, design our roll-up banners for us. So that we can put in the, or design our signage, design this. So they're always calling you to design the artifact. Remember, artifact designers, there's a cap to how much you can make. Because the problem you're solving, the P problem you're solving is a product problem. Now, if you want to go to the next level of design, now there are people we call, that we call the design thinkers. Design thinkers. Now, these people also solve a problem. But they don't solve a product problem like the artifact designer. No, they solve another P problem, which is a process problem. They focus more on the process. So they are hired to solve a process problem. So they think about what is the process of people getting to this product. So they're not thinking about the product. They're not thinking about the biscuits on the shelf. They are thinking about how do people get to the biscuit. What is the experience of people getting to this biscuit? That is, from when it leaves the factory to when it gets to the end user. What is that experience? So they design the process. Now, these people get paid more because they are solving a, a bigger problem. Now, they are solving a bigger problem because the solutions they give affect how much profit the, the company makes. It affects how much customers the company has. So they think about it. They think about, okay, um, I'll use that school example. Let's use the school example so it runs through. Now, the artifact designer is giving the flyer, the roll-up banner, the whatever it is, the artifact to work on. Now, the design thinker, the, the school contacts the design thinker to say, you know what? We have this problem. We have a school. But at every beginning of the term, we only have 100 students, 100 new people register or enroll in this school. Now, we want you as a designer to take that number from 100 to 1,000 at the beginning of every term. So you see that they're not telling you to solve a, an artifact problem. They're telling you to solve a process problem. Take 100 and make it 1,000. You understand? So in, yes, in, in the long run, you are solving, you are making more money for the school. That is, you are getting how many more people? 999 hundred people to pay school fees. Who do you think they will pay more? Will they pay the guy that is doing the flyer, the guy that is getting them more students? The design thinker, sir. The design thinker. So because the design thinker now thinks of the, pro the process. So he thinks of, okay, how do I influence people to make a decision towards this school? whereby they think the school A here and school B. And I say, okay, at every time I'm going to compare school A to school B, I will always choose school B. So the design thinker thinks, okay, I want to drive people to the website of this school so that they can get more information about the school. So he thinks about a process. He thinks about the fact that, okay, what we are going to do, we are going to start designing flyers. We will design flyers that has your website boldly written there or on your um, social media, we will drive people to your website. So when people go to your website, they see a big button that says register now and get 10% off. You understand what I'm saying? Or register now and get this off. So he drives them to the website. So he designs a process. And in designing that process, he employs artifact designer. You understand what I'm saying? So he says, I know a good website guy. He will do a website for you. I know a good social media guy. He will do good social media flyers for you. I know a good signage guy who do so because it's influencing more people and getting more people into the project 
but realize he's working with organizations and is affecting their sales and their profits. So he gets more money. He gets paid more. So think about it yeah, now. Sure. If you're a designer watching this, are you a design thinker? You understand? You want to earn more money, but what problem are you solving? Are you solving a product problem or a process problem? You have to think about it because a product can never get you the money that process does. As a matter of fact, a lot of times, design thinkers do not touch software. They do not touch Photoshop or touch Illustrator. Do you understand? They, they don't do that. They touch the mind. So they have swapped their, their laptops for their mind. You understand? So, so now what they're offering is their mind. So sometimes they can be art directors. You understand? They, buy, they can be creative directors. And I, I tell people, I, I had a, a, a designer friend of mine, and, and I was telling him, look, you've been doing design for how many years now? At this point, you should stop applying for graphic, design, graphic designer jobs. Because he was telling me he wants to make more money. He wants to make more money. I said, you can never make more money if you keep applying for those. We need a graphic designer. No, you must start. Hello, sir. You know what I was saying? I told him. Yeah, yeah, do you hear yeah. me? Yeah, can you hear you now, sir? Okay. So I was telling the friend of mine that he needs to start applying to being the creative director. When you see a vacancy for graphic designer, you skip it back. You skip it and go for a vacancy that says design creative director. You understand? So you're, you're now trying to elevate yourself to being a design thinker. Because there's a number of years that you give to artifact design that you say, I'm graduating from here to being a design thinker. You understand? You must graduate. But the problem is that a lot of designers wait for a permission to graduate. They wait for a permission. They wait for someone to offer it to them to say, come and be our creative director. But that would never happen. That way you can get somebody that is an artifact designer for 20 years. He's an artifact designer for 20 years because he's waiting for someone to give him permission to become a design thinker. You understand? But you must be able yes. to say, look, I've been doing artifact design for the past seven years. I think I've done, I've paid my dues in being an artifact designer. Any graphic design job out there, I'm not taking it. I'm going for a creative designer, your creative director job. I'm going to be a design thinker. I'm going to start my journey being a design thinker. That is how you begin to earn more money. Then you realize that the material that you are, that, that you are consuming will be different. You stop looking at 100 top design in, in, in Instagram. You start thinking about books that talk about design process. You start looking at people. You start having mentors that think about design process. You are no longer looking to Abduzido or all those how to use Photoshop sites because you are now thinking of elevating. So that's the second part of the pyramid, the design thinker. Now, all, all right, the third sir. part of the pyramid. Sorry for cutting yeah. you short, sir. Before you move to the, to the last stage, sir, we'd like you to quickly talk about the, um, the third stage so we can switch the role now. Most of the things we've been talking about has been from the stance of um, a graphic designer. So I would like us to yeah. approach it from the stance of the users, like the, the, from, the, from the user's point of view, so they can, mm. people that are joining us that, will, that would watch this video after that are not designers can also relate. They can see their own role, their own part in all of this. Thank you, sir. Yeah. The, the, and the thing is that, you know, when we talk about design issues, then, it starts from the creative. Um, in, in, in the sense, you think of how does design influence people. And, and you, you need to start thinking of how you can adjust yourself as a designer. When you adjust yourself as a designer, the people kind of fall into it, you understand? So now, I, 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 I don't want us to assume that the people that are joining us that are non-designers um, will not appreciate the message we are, we are giving to designers because people on a constant basis work with designers. You understand? Yeah, they and, and, and that's where, and, and that's where you, you realize that when you fix the designer, you fix the client. You understand? So, so, sure. so, I, so I really feel like clients need to understand what it takes to be a designer. So I will stop having, having this argument of, oh, you should be paying me this. This is the value of this. Because sometimes these clients yes. don't know what you're doing. 
when you go to a client and you're saying you're a design thinker, mm, they don't understand that you're taking them from 100 to 10,000 customers. And then they don't understand what they're paying for. As a matter of fact, they think it's because they have such a good school. They believe, oh, man, because we're teaching people in our school very well. That's why they don't know that what they're paying for is the fact that a designer has come to solve your problem. You understand? So, 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 and that's why I'm focusing more on the designers. You understand? Because the designers the two problem. You fix the client problem. So, as I was saying, the, 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 the second level of, I said there are two levels. The, the, the artifact designer who designs uh, flyers, banners, you know, artifacts. And then the, the design um, um, thinker who designs Thinkers. the process. It, yes, he designs the process of how to get a, a, a school, for example, from 100 people to 1,000 or 100,000 people. Now, at the top of the food chain, at the top of the chain, are people we call the design leaders. Design leaders. Now, that's the epitome of, of design in the pyramid, to be a design leader. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think we have any design leaders in Nigeria as of yet. But well, let me put it this way. I don't think we have any activated design leaders. There might be people that are design leaders internally, but they are not activated yet because they've not started leading with design. And this is where the people come in. Now, what is the problem that design leaders solve? What's the problem design leaders solve? Now, remember, the problem artifact designers solve is a product problem. The problem design thinkers solve is a process problem. But the problem design leaders solve is a people problem. They solve a people problem. And this is where the, the audience that you are talking about, this is where they really come in. Um, the people that are not designers. The design leader influences people in the sense that he does more of behavioral design. And um, I will still use that school example. The school example, they, are, they, they hire an artifact designer to say, uh, design a flyer. They hire a design thinker to say, get our um, admission rate to improve. They, I, then you can see a design leader, where does it come in? Now, a design leader doesn't work with the school. In fact, the school doesn't call on the design leader. The people that call on the design leader are government stakeholders. A country calls on design leaders. And um, I'll, I'll give the same school example. Let's say the government of Nigeria now, or the government of a state, maybe Lagos state, realizes that, hmm, we've realized that girls between the age of 14 to 19 drop out of school. They don't go to school anymore. That's where a design leader comes in. Because now, he's meant to fix a problem of girls within an age range going to school. So he's fixing an education mentality problem. I remember we used to have, we have, we have this problem in Nigeria where we say some people in the East don't let boys go to school after a particular period of time. They say they can drop out of school and face business. Or we can say some people in the North don't allow their girls to go to school. That's where design problems, design leaders come and solve a people problem. So they come in and say, how can we solve a problem of people's mind and their behavior and get them to start getting their daughters to go to school? We have an issue right now in Nigeria, in the world going on with rape. You understand? There's a rape issue. Every time you go on, every time someone has been raped, this person has been raped, you understand? A design leader yes, can come in and solve a rape problem and say, why are people getting raped? You understand? And, and, and a government employs them and says, you know what? Let's bring about a strategy to bring down the rate of rape in a particular place. Or they can say the crime rate in this place is too high. Let's get people to stop committing crimes. Or you can say, oh, let's think of a way of getting people to stop polluting Lagos. People to stop throwing things out of their cars. That's a big problem. How much do you think that person is going to be paid? He's going to be paid a whole lot of money because he's influencing the decision of people, of a, of a nation, 
you understand? So if yeah, if, true. if someone you, you, you know how Lagos is right now. Sorry, I'm not I'm not trying to get at Lagos. I used to live in Lagos for a while. But now some places in Lagos is right now. Like if you go to like I don't know if Ayege, you know, those pen cinema places are still like that, but there's a place where there's a, a heap of, of trash that is bigger than my house. You understand what I'm saying? If, yeah, I do. If someone employed me as a as a design leader to think, okay, you know what, over the next five years. I want you to get people to stop throwing trash in that place. That place should be the cleanest place in Lagos. How much do you think it will cost for me to do that? How much do you think? How, how big of a problem do you think that would be for the? Do you think they will pay me? Do you think they will offer me ten thousand naira? Never. Do you think they will offer me a hundred thousand naira? No, they won't. Do you think they will offer me one million naira? Over a million, sir. <laughs> It's too small, you understand? Because if yes, I solve sir. that problem, I'm solving an epidemic problem to start, start with. I'm solving a, a health problem. I'm solving an environmental problem. I'm solving a political problem. You know, know what I'm saying? Because whoever health comes up problem, to, to yeah. say he's the local government chairman of that place and he solves that problem, he gets voted in again. You understand what I'm saying? So that's how you can True. use design leadership to attract more income. That is the epitome of being a designer. And that's why I, I think designers do not even know the design pyramid. So just think, okay, I'm going to live and die an artifact designer. And if you have that mentality, you live and die poor or live and die average. I don't think anybody, when they are 40, 45 years old, should be carrying their laptop around saying, um, let me show you your logo now. No, no, you shouldn't be doing that at a particular <laughs> age. So you must graduate from being an artifact to being a design thinker to being a design leader. And design leading is so, is so interesting that it, it's ridiculous in the sense that um, you see what's going on in the world right now with yes, um, COVID-19. You see, you go out and everybody's wearing all manner of masks. Some people are wearing shields. Some people are putting, uh, what they call it, bottles on their head, this refill, um, yeah, dispenser bottles the, on dispenser, their head. Dispenser, yeah. Look, some of these people have never met someone that has COVID-19 before. They've never known anybody that knows somebody that knows somebody that has COVID-19. But they are covering up. And that's because WHO employs the best of minds in design to get people to act in particular ways. It is not by chance. You try it out. Form an, form an organization and tell people there's a virus there and see if people will take it seriously. You, in fact, carry like 100 dead bodies and tell them they all died from... People will move on with their lives. But, but smart companies employ design leaders that put in place strategy to implant something in people to make you act, even though you do not see... Even if you are not directly yeah. in, in, affected by this thing, just act accordingly. You understand? That is the problem design leaders solve. Imagine if somebody could come right now and solve this COVID-19 problem in Nigeria to say, look, we're going to, we're going to start bringing down the calls, you understand? And someone can say, we're going to bring a design problem and employ design um, thinkers and artifact Leaders. designers to solve this problem. You get paid more. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And how I know we don't have design leaders in Nigeria, the way I know we don't have design leaders in Nigeria, you look at our political... Our political terrain. The, the, the fact that we have a lot of violence during election period shows that we don't have design thinkers. It shows that we don't have design, design leaders in Nigeria. It just shows. And that is why people have to impose and force people and kill people to be elected into office. In more mature societies where they use design leading to influence people, people enter office without shooting a bullet. You understand? Like in the, in the UK, in the US, nobody, you don't see anybody snatching ballot boxes or shooting somebody. You don't hear about that because they have design leaders that will help you to do what you don't know you want to do. And that's right, you, you have a company called um, Cambridge Analytica. They're very popular during this Trump campaign. Those people helped Trump to win the election through design thinking. That's what they did. They were paid hundreds of millions of dollars to help them
to help Trump to win the election. And that, that's, that's totally design thinking there. So when you solve a people problem where you can solve a behavioral pro problem and solve a belief problem, where people, you can change people's belief system, then you realize that you get paid more. And that's where every designer should strive to be. You understand? That is what, that's what every society should try to promote. We should try to promote design thinkers. We should try to open up an avenue for design thinkers and design leaders. There's an avenue for, for artifact designers. And that's why when you said, let's switch it up to talk about the users. I said, no, the only way we can talk about the users is for the users to understand, understand that there's a place for design thinkers and begin to understand that I need to pay someone to think about design. You understand? So, so just don't say, I've had, I've had clients tell me that. So they tell me, okay, I want to start this business. Can you help me with the strategy for my brand? And I tell them, okay, do this, do this, call your business this name, employ this and this. And I say, okay, pay me X amount. And they say, uh -uh, why am I paying you this money? You didn't do anything now. All you just did is talk. Because they don't understand the term design thinking. So it's time for even non-designers to know the category of design. You understand? So that you know, okay, I'm, I'm employing this person as a design thinker. So my money is not going to waste just because this person did not give me something, a JPEG. You understand? Because this person just talked to me. Yeah, true. I'm paying this person a premium because of their mind. Because they're helping me with the process. I'm paying this person a premium because they're they are helping me to influence the minds of people. And that's why I believe design goes to school. It's, it's a good platform. But it must help to orientate the government too. To let us know that there must be a ministry of design. There must be a department yeah, that, that, of design. That's one of the big, design, that was, that was design one of the big aims. Sir. Yes, it's very important. You understand? So, so there's no discussion that is just for designers. The discussion that for designers is for everybody. You understand? There is no, True. Everything must, must be brought to the forefront. Where, where, when you appoint ministers, you appoint ministers in, 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 in charge of design. Design must design. You see that organizations that have design at the decision making table do excellently well. And that's why we look at most organizations have a CFO, Chief Finance Officer. They have a CEO, Chief Executive Officer. They have a COO, Chief Operations Officer. Okay. And they believe that is the triangle. You understand? They believe that the triangle that makes things work. Then the designer. All they do is hire an artifact designer, and that's the de design department for them. You understand? But people must understand that, look, that, that table is not complete. You have a CEO. Yes, we need a chief executive officer that makes the executive decision. We have a CFO, chief finance officials, or officer, someone that thinks about the money going in and money coming out. Then you have the COO, operation, person that thinks of how this department interacts. But you must have a chief design officer someone that thinks so, so, about sorry sir what yeah sorry sir D this session well, will end like in one or two minutes from now so we're okay, going to right. come back again so from for you guys uh, you can join us back whenever this um session ends now so you can join okay. us to continue the conversation i think we can take okay. maybe like more 10 or 15 minutes just to wrap everything up okay all right. all right all right all right okay you can continue sir Okay, so, so until on that table, you have an office called a CDO, the Chief Design Officer. Your, your company not, can do well, but not, but will not be excellent, will not do excellently well. And now by organizations like Coca-Cola, they have a CDO. You have organizations like um, Apple, they have a Apple. CDO. Organizations like a Amazon, they have Nike. a Nike. Design must have a place on the table, even in government, because design influences people and their decisions and how they act. That's it. And, and, and you see, we have, that's why we have world problems. Like, you've heard of global warming. You've heard of global warming. What, yes, are you yes, doing yes. To, what are you doing to avoid global warming? A lot of people are not doing anything because they don't understand it. Because no design, no design leader has come to explain it to them and make them understand that their choices have an influence on the way our earth is run. You understand? So the, the, the design must have an office in every sphere of life, especially in government. If you have design operating in government, then we, mm. we would have less we would have less violence because people are forced. So to sorry, um, 
Sorry, the millionaire God just sent something. I said a church in America has a creative pastor. Imagine, sir. Of course, of course. Every church must. Every organization. If, if a church doesn't have someone in charge of design, the church, the church can.